Welcome to Gardening and Beyond. I'm Lee Reeder. While our audience is mostly adults, we recognize the importance of teaching children to be comfortable in the natural world. Nearby Nature offers this service. Its education coordinator, Joe Niedek, has been helping children appreciate nature for 15 years. A master gardener, Joe has been a teacher, a coordinator for children's science enrichment programs, and environmental monitor on the Appalachian Trail an advocate for experiential learning and connecting kids with nature and our children. Na Nearby Nature is her dream job. Welcome to the show, Joe. Hi, thank you, Lee. <laughs> so we spent a very enjoyable hour or so uh, at Nearby Nature a couple of weeks ago taking some, some footage uh, around uh, the grounds there and seeing some of what you're doing. And uh, we're going to show some video of that, of course, uh, in a little while uh, to s to so that everybody can see what all Nearby Nature is doing. But I wanted to talk with you first a little bit and just find out more about you and, and uh, what brought you here. I'm particularly interested to know what brought you to Oregon. Yeah, I'm a non-native Oregonian myself, and I kind of have an idea of, of what drew me here. It just seems like there are, well, people have all kinds of reasons for coming here, and I'm, I'm curious to know what brought you. And um, there's, there's not one, just one single thing that brought me here. There was a combination. I became very interested in some of Michael Pollan's work and some of the... Um, Michael Pollan, the author. The author, um, and about more urban the urban agriculture, suburban and urban agriculture, permaculture, that movement, um, looking at, at ways of living a more environmentally conscious life where I had been living in New England was a little, I was looking, I was looking for an area where I could really see it being done and participate in that lifestyle. So that was one thing. So um, you felt that that was actually happening I, in Oregon? More than anywhere else. We were traveling around looking for places um, that felt good. Uh, Eugene really impressed us. That way, the bike trails were a huge draw. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I had a daughter who was living in Eugene for a while. She's now moved down to California, but um, she kept telling us how wonderful Eugene was and how we would fit here. So when we came in and visited Eugene and um, saw what was going on with community gardens, with um, alternative transportation options, things like that, it felt like a very livable place and a good place to learn, too. So does it seem to you that, oh, well, let's just take... Um a comparison with mm -hmm. where you were living in New England. Mm -hmm. Does it seem like uh, there are many more options for environmentally aware living here than what can typically be found in other parts of the country? I think that there are more people actively engaged in developing them and pursuing them. and. There are, there's, there's interest in New England. There's definitely progressive thinking there mm -hmm. also. Um, but I, I did find that in Oregon, it, it seemed like there was more options for people sharing their knowledge, people that have been trying, trying alternative ways of, um, I guess, living. Mm -hmm. What do you think is driving that? I don't know. It's interesting. <laughs> Maybe there's an energy vortex here or something that's drawing us that's all. That's as good I, an explanation you know, as any I, I've heard. I don't, I don't know. There's other pockets, you know, around the country. I think probably it's a university town, too. So mm -hmm. I don't necessarily find that's the only... I haven't... My experience has not been that it's necessarily all university centered and driven. There's a lot of wonderful naturalists and all um, that have connections to the university. Mm -hmm, sure. But there's also um, just a, a lot of people who are trying to 
figure out good ways of living yeah and, there's and working in community there there are a lot of small agriculturalists here mm -hmm. uh, running uh, either hobby farms or something a little bit bigger than a hobby farm but they're actually making a living from it mm -hmm. and uh, very interested in organic um, gardening and and crop growing or has animal husbandry and so and even even people transforming their yards yeah you know getting rid of the grass putting in the garden space yes. out in river road where i live it's wonderful to just ride around in the diversity you see you know you still see the traditional manicured irrigated lawns mm -hmm. but then you'll be a couple houses down somebody will have a garden in their yard and chickens in the back and mm -hmm. and so that um work working to make a a neighborhood that is more maybe self-sufficient in food, more food security. Um, there's the suburban suburban permaculture uh, convergence is happening on River Road soon, which is going to be a great opportunity to network. Which we're deviating from nearby nature, you know, I realize, <laughs> but that's the end of August. Um, that may have happened by the time this airs. So there's a lot of interest, really interesting things going on here. So we don't know exactly why it is that this region uh, mm -hmm. is doing what it's doing. Maybe it is that, that vortex that you mentioned. <laughs> but whatever it I is... I haven't heard of it before. <laughs> I just did <laughs> <laughs> Something's going That's on, right. and, and there are, you're right, there are a lot of people here who are very interested in and very environmentally aware and, and mm -hmm. doing their best to, to live responsibly and to encourage food security. We've been doing that a lot on the show as well, talking about food mm -hmm. security and how important that is, as well as water conservation. So yes. um, yeah, I, we all just need to keep pulling together on that. Well, getting back to, to you and, and what brought you here, I know that you used to be a school teacher, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering what, um, what caused you to move from that to uh, running programs for Nearby Nature? Well, part of it was when I came to Oregon, I wasn't sure if I wanted to continue in traditional public school. I am, I'm not an indoor person, mm -hmm. and so being constrained to a classroom or to infrequent trips outside of the classroom with the kids was rather frustrating. But also, the school systems really were not hiring. There weren't a lot of job opportunities. Um, so I, even even getting my license transferred and getting registered to sub was a very long process. It was amazing to me because I've never been anywhere where I couldn't just walk in and begin substitute teaching immediately hmm. and be in demand. Mm -hmm. um, I was a science teacher. So um, and I should qualify that. I haven't lived that many places. It wasn't like I was traveling all around subbing, but it just was unusual in, in my experience. Um, but I started volunteering for Nearby Nature a little bit as I was working part-time. And I just, the organization was really doing a lot of experiential learning, a lot of getting kids outside, um, involved in nature that was very close to my close to my heart, and felt it, it just felt like the direction that I wanted to go. Uh, that I I think environmental education was such an important part of my science teaching. That was mm -hmm. the part I, as a middle school teacher I was teaching a very broad based science where I was touching on all the disciplines. I used to teach 6th, 7th, and 8th grade and so I was teaching life science, earth science, physical science, a little bit of everything, but the environmental science was always what I turned your really, crank. Yeah, <laughs> turned my crank, got me, was, was what I was most excited about mm -hmm. and, and valued the most. Yep. Yeah. So at what point did you join Nearby Nature as a staff member? Um, I volunteered for them for I think about a year, and then I started as a weekend as their weekend coordinator, um, which was doing the family nature class that we put on about 
every other month. Mm -hmm. And also, I would oversee the festivals where we'd have a presence with the table. So it was a very part-time job mm -hmm. to start. And then the education coordinator position became available, and I applied for that and, and was able to get that. So that is now that is taking up all of my time. <laughs> <laughs> that is a, that and you've is a been doing that, what, a couple of years? A couple or? years, yeah. yeah. It will be, it's a little over two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've been talking all around nearby nature. Mm -hmm. um, tell us, what is precisely nearby nature? What is the organization? What is its philosophy? What mm -hmm. is it that you're seeking to do? So uh, I, I think we have a lovely name, um, Nearby Nature, and that really helps explain maybe how we're different from some other environmental groups. I think one of Nearby Nature, we're, we're seeking to foster environmental awareness um, and a connection with nature. Mm -hmm. And so good stewardship is definitely part of that. But also, there is, maybe I, c I could almost call it a misconception of nature as being other, as being separate for us. Nature is everywhere. We're all part of nature. You can just walk outside your door and you're, you're in the natural world. And building that awareness, building the awareness of the wonderful resources within our community, of the parks, of that you can go very close by. You can, anywhere in Eugene, you know, you're within a mile of a park, of a place where you can take your children, take your family, um, and, and experience the natural world, even in your own backyard. Mm -hmm. You know, there are things you can do, and, and we try to, that's, that's one aspect of our program. Um, but then, as far as what we actually are and what we actually do, we have a partnership in the city, with the city, and we have a little space in Alton Baker Park that we manage. Um, it's about an acre that we use for some of our educational programs, like our summer day camp. We also have a yurt there that is part of the Network Charter School, which we're a partner with. And high school and middle school students attend classes there during the school year. And those are all in the environmental science And those are regular classes. academically accredited, accredited. classes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Done through the Network Charter School, which is, which is part of um, 4J, one of their alternative schools. And, um, and then we also do um, restoration work in the park and we do park cleanup so we have a we have a lot of a, a kind of a lot of little things that we're doing mm -hmm. in our organization and let's see we also do school field trip programs yeah out in out in Alton Baker Park so this is probably a good moment to play the video the, that we uh, or at least our first video that we have that shows more about that acre that you have mm -hmm. in Alton Baker Park and, and some of the learning landscape that, that you have there. So if we could see that video, that would be great. Oh, here we go. Why don't we start by telling us your name and uh, what nearby nature is. So my name is Jane I've been with the organization about three years, but it's been in Eugene for over 20 years. And um, we're, we're interested in um, education and in providing information for people on how to live um, in harmony with the earth and ecological lifestyles. Um, we have a site here, we're in a partnership with the city where we have a site that we maintain and you can see we're a certified wildlife habitat. Um, we encourage pollinators. We do a lot with natural plants. And we run a summer camp here in the summer. We also are part of the Network Charter School. So there, that's a um, high school and middle school that is centered on Portland Street in Eugene. But they have a classroom in our yurt back here where they do their science and environmental studies classes. And then we also do field trips in the, during the school year for elementary school children that we do here in Alton Baker Park. 
and we also um, do a lot of educating through our volunteer and internship programs because we get college students and adults out here to help us educate the kids. We train them so they're learning too. So that is um, pretty much what Nearby Nature does and, and we'll also offer some weekend events for families that are uh, we call nature quests that are also educational. We do some preschool days and just try to get people out and um, I think one of the things that makes us unique is that nature nearby. We want to make people aware that nature is all around us. It's not a separate thing. It's not another. It's part of us and here in Eugene we have all these great parks. Uh, we have the river trails. We have Alton Baker Park and making people aware of the resources right here in the community. Yeah, you can probably move in a little bit closer. Okay, go ahead. Even more. Uh, okay, that's a little Okay. Okay, just right about there. Good. Okay. So, would you, like, would you like to see our site? I'd love to walk you through this. Yeah, let's definitely take a tour. <laughs> A lot of our site, a lot of the construction in our site has been done, well, it's all been done by volunteers. So we have a lot of wonderful people in the community. We work with Eagle Scouts have done some of the infrastructure. Um, this little arch goes into an area that we call the nest. And this is where our preschooler camps will be centered. So you can see they've there's a camp going on here this week. They're off on an adventure in the park right now. But this is a little space. Um, we've landscaped with a lot of native plants. We have, this was done by one of our interns last year. It's a little hut made with hazelnut whips or hazelnut um, prunings. And so the kids can go crawl in there. We've also created little spaces here. So one of the things that we encourage with our camps is we do organized activities, but we also give them time to play and explore. And we've really created our site with that in mind. And so this is one of the little spaces that we have. This is great. All these, all of these little secret passageways and hiding places. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, can I would have loved this when I was a kid. Yes. Yeah. That, so. Um, that's one of the things that we're trying to promote too and just get kids to realize yeah it's it's a wonderful place to connect to be out and play in nature and, and so that is a lot of our landscaping is is done intentionally kid friendly um, we have this is a pollinators area right now we have soldago or goldenrod and then the asters are here um, some of the other flowers or earlier, we have the California poppies. Um, this is an area over here that we call Squirrel Kitchen, and we also have a beaver dam area. So we have a lot of yarrows, we have thimbleberries, um, we have our bean teepees and sunflowers going, a lot of the calendula. This is kind of our lemon bomb forest here. So is this a combination play educational area? Yes. Yeah. So definitely this is a place um, kids love to sit and hop on stumps. So and over here you can see they've been creating. Uh, I think these are, they were setting traps. They were trying to get some tracks. I don't know if any squirrels came. Looks like a little something, maybe a mouse. That's peanut butter, I guess. Peanut butter, yes, to bait them, <laughs> to lure them in. They were just, they're not trying to catch the animals, just get tracks, footprints. Uh -huh. um, and in this area, I don't know if you can see, but we have a hose that will run water through and they can pretend to be beavers and, you know, figure out how to make a dam and dam up the water, <laughs> create a pond. So that's, that's a really popular activity that we have here and they get muddy and, you know, it's, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> and this is also, also right here is a little area where we might sit and tell stories. We'll try to create spaces, seating, um, and balancing, you know, all of those things mm -hmm. that are just developmentally are great for kids to be able to walk on logs and hop on stumps. And there are passages, I'm not going to make you walk through all of them, but 
Like there oh, are why, passages. why not? Let's, are let's walk through it? the passages. Okay. Let's go through this kind of little maze that we've set up here. And, you know, we'll plant raspberries. Um, there, there's still a few on, but they love love to come through. And if you're if you're a kid, you know, this is, you can kind of just go under here. <laughs> the little ones can go through and pick raspberries. That's also very popular. Got it? Mm-hmm. Okay. And then in this area, we have our little orchard that was planted about six years ago. We got a grant actually seven years ago um, and we put in these fruit trees so we have some apples we have plums um, we have an Asian pear so and probably the greatest challenge with that is to keep the kids from picking them before they're ripe because yeah. they're very excited to be able to be somewhere and Reach pick the and fruit pick fruit yeah yes. uh, oh, you have a l nice plum harvest coming on it looks like yeah you see that higher one so and we have you can if you want to identify the plums we have the little rocks here paint it with the names of the different kinds of fruits so you can see this is a brooks plum we have a satsuma over there do the kid do the kids make these uh, identifiers the, the identifiers were made by one of the college interns mm -hmm. this spring before camp so I have that um the kids love to eat the flowers too. We, we teach them that like the primroses and the calendula are edible flowers. We also have borage, which is good. Do your educational uh, efforts include actual gardening practice? Yes, and some of them more so than others. We have some camps that are totally garden themed, but all of them we encourage the instructors to have the kids harvest. We have a solar oven that we cook in. Um, we do watering, planting, and different. Some of the camps will be themed more with animals or with geology, or and then some are specifically focused on gardening. But all of them use our gardens, and all of them harvest our fruit and other things. This is another another area here, and they've we've had some creative campers this week. <laughs> no, <laughs> what what are nature builders? And so what we do is we'll, we'll kind of have materials ready. We have stones here. Um, this, the campers have put this structure, I think they told me it was a fort oh, up of here course. that they're it's building. <laughs> yeah, so, so when we have some nice prunings that are good for building with, we'll stash them over here. Um, early in the spring, or early in the summer, this was loaded with those little sugar plums, so. That was also a lot of fun here. They were, you know, walking along those logs and just picking plums and eating them. Um, this is our this twin berry tunnel, we call it. So you have the twin berries over here and they can, can crawl through here. We try to keep it trimmed up so we can see them <laughs> as, they're, <laughs> as they're crawling around in there. But that's another fun place that we've created. How many interns or other staff do you have to sort of keep tabs on all of your campers? Uh, so each camp, we'll have one instructor and then two volunteers, a teen volunteer, and it's generally a college intern or an adult volunteer, somebody that's interested and has the time. And um, we top our camps at 12 kids. So it's... Yeah, um, I mean, even with all their little hiding spaces and all, we're able to keep track of everybody. <laughs> we have another another raspberry run through here. Um, the raspberry bushes back there, some more fruit trees. And then this is our what we call our edible schoolyard or, you know, kind of our more formal garden space. And so this is the herb area right in here. And then you can come over and see our vegetable planting. We have um, our park host, Paul Catino, is actually teaching one of the camps this week, and he lives here on site, and one of his jobs is kind of overseeing the garden maintenance and giving the interns assignments 
as far as the gardening tasks. So he's a really important part of our program. And so this is, like you said, our Learnscape Garden. They've been, um, they had some grain, some buckwheat, and um, barley planted here that's been cut down recently. And so now that nasturtiums are coming up, our squash and pumpkins. You can see we've got, we try to encourage the kids to eat their greens. We'll do kale chips in the solar oven. And how, how popular are the kale chips? Um, I think, uh, you know, they go over all right. I think they're more excited when we make apple cobbler. Um, but we also roast beets and carrots, and, and a lot of the kids really like those. Um, do zucchini chips. Or anything that they have inside the journal. Where are the mushroom people? Um, okay, I would love to hear. Walk you, walk you through. We're still um, using overhead watering. We don't have, we'd, we'd like to get better infrastructure for our watering, but we need, I guess, time and money <laughs> to do that. Yeah. Pumpkins? Yes, we have the pumpkins are doing really well. Um, we have, yeah, we have peppers, tomatoes, kind of a variety. Our sunflowers are amazing this year. And the pollinators like those. They really are amazing. Yeah. They're all branched like trees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've gotten like trees and they're really tall. I've noticed the community garden sunflowers are super tall this year too. So I think it's a good year for sunflowers. Even though the rest of us have been roasting, I guess certain plants really like this hot, dry weather. Right. It's, there's always something, right, that's going to like it. Um, back here we have two, two other areas that we've created. This one we call Pollinators Playground. So we're trying to do, again, a lot of native plants that the pollinators like. Um, some of them have, you know, are past their prime, obviously some of them are going to seed and we're putting in, we have some of the wild currants and we have snowberries in addition to goldenrod and asters. Um, this one's a beautiful plant in its time, it's, it's past now, but that's a um, Colomia grandiflora. And so this is this is another area that we'll use for camp sometimes, or um, for when visitors come. And we've just cleared this one out this year. So this was this was all kind of overgrown, and we're constantly trying to improve and create new spaces in the site. So this was this past fall and springs project. Do you have irrigation over here? No, we don't. We don't. So these plants are just making it on their own. Um, if we put in some new plantings, we will, you know, run a hose over, give them a little bit of support. But pretty much this is, this is just native. So you can see in some people's estimation, it might not be as pretty and green, but, you know, this is the season. This is what it's doing this time of year. Mm -hmm. And then one of my favorite places in our entire camp is right over here and it's what we call Hazelnut Hollow. On a hot summer day it's a great place to be. We've got this giant hazelnut tree and we've created a little, a little um, campsite over here. We also, it's a great place for storytelling. This is great. So this is what we call Hazelnut Hollow and you can see we kind of set up the stumps for a natural seating area. And we do have a camp centered here but they're also off on an adventure right now. This must, this must be so much fun for children because it, it has such a, an, a, 
a storybook feel to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's fun for the adults, too. We like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that reminds me, I was going to ask you if you do anything that's just focused on adults or if it's all really focused on children. You know, we've tried once or twice. We've offered workshops for adults in the Learnscape. And um, other, other than Dave Wagner doing, he does um, a card workshop, and we've done that a couple times with a decent number of attendees but it just seems like we don't they don't come out for us what we do what we do get adults for though is is work parties um, I didn't mention that but another thing that nearby nature does in return for having this little place in Alton Baker Park we coordinate the cleanup park cleanup parties and Paul that's another one of his duties he wears a lot of hats here um, but Paul Catino, our park host, will coordinate um, efforts, get volunteers signed out, and works with Solve um, to do park cleanups. Go out and just we'll pick up a whole bunch of garbage and, and also do some native plantings in the park. So that's the thing that we do get adults out for, mm -hmm. and people will turn out for um, Coles, for example, and Comcast have sent employees out. And, pretty large numbers to help us and then some of the fraternities and sororities will come out oh, great and help so just a, a good community effort mm -hmm. and let's see oh the yurt over there is not we don't use it in the summer but during the school year that's where the charter school middle school and high school students have are centered and they also they all work in the garden so we do a lot of garden education with them that way and then they'll also they have a course where they go fishing um you know we're right by the rivers right down here and they'll also do environmental studies in the park. So you're saying that these schools have a regular weekly curriculum mm -hmm. that is centered here? Right. So it's Network Charter, and they're a great school, um, an alternative school. So the class sizes are smaller, um, and they, they do a lot of kind of the more hands-on education, I guess, is their philosophy. So we have... Um, we have two teachers from Network Charter that have their classes here, and they're actually they're part of Nearby Nature. Network Charter is a partnership with a couple different nonprofits in the area. And so, yeah, and then we can go spy on Paul's camp for a minute. He's doing a camp. Um, the title is Earthworks and Words. So, talking about kind of how. Nature Inspires Art is the theme of that. They're doing writing, drawing, um, inspired by nature. And it looks like maybe they're getting ready with some hiking sticks. Hi, Paul. Hey. Uh, so these are what? <laughs> I'm making a uh, children's TV show. And, uh, I forgot to tell you guys, you guys are the stars. So. <gasps> there we are? Yeah. There we are. Why do you think I've been trying to get you guys to share poems in front of everybody? I've been auditioning for lead roles. <laughs> if I warned you, I'm not the experience. I would not agree. Alright, I was pretty good acting. So, Paul is not only our park host and in charge of our gardens and our restoration work, but he also teaches a couple camps during the summer. So, yeah. Yay, camp. Yeah. Yay. Tell them all that you're having fun, guys. Yeah. We're I'm having, having fun. fun. <laughs> I am having so much fun in this camp. See, I do have a <laughs> Yeah, you're acting right now. <laughs> and are, what are these sticks? You're equipping the children with sticks, Paul. What's yeah, going we can on? Our these are our, these are our walking no, sticks. There are lightsavers. No, there are walking sticks. No, no there are lightsabers. No, 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 each one of us has, each one of us has a different one. They're thought-provoking works of art which support us in our times of greatest trials when we're walking very far across the park. Hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks guys. guys. Yes. <laughs> and the other camps are all off walking through the park right now. Or maybe wading in the river. They do a lot of that, too. 
That sounds fun. Hopefully yeah. turning over rocks and seeing what critters are under. Underneath, exactly. <laughs> And we do, I, actually I know the littlest ones, we have our nets and basins and we do pond dipping. So just to see what kind of little um, macro invertebrates, the, a lot of the larvae, a lot of like the dragonfly larvae and the water boatmen and different things, they'll be able to, you know, get out of the ponds or the canal and look at. And then we return them, you know, we're always kind, we always put them back in their home. Do the children leave here with any kind of certification in the classes that they take, you know, such as gardening care or herbal knowledge or fishing knowledge or something like that? Um, not from our camp programs. We don't do certificates. Um, with the charter school students, with the high school and middle school students, I mean, they get their diploma. They'll have their transcript. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't. We, we haven't thought about certifying, no. Why don't you start by telling us your name and uh, what Nearby Nature is? Okay, so my name's Joe Niedek yeah. and yeah, I'm I the educator. I'm struck all over again by what an intriguing space you have at, mm -hmm. the, uh, at the Learnscape at Nearby Nature. Right. It just felt like like a place out of a fairy tale almost, uh, mm -hmm. where children could scamper about and find hiding places and, <laughs> and yeah. make little things and pretend that they were, you know, uh, off on a great adventure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm thinking that there must have been some, some really good minds that went that were a part of creating that place and designing it and, and making it so so interesting for children. So why don't you talk about that? So um, this was before I became involved with Nearby Nature, though I have seen improvement even in the short time, in the few years that I've been there. But the previous park host, before Paul Catino, who we just saw mm -hmm. on here, and he's been with us for a little over a year. Um, but the previous park host, Aaron Lamb, is really the mastermind, I believe, behind that whole learnscape creation. Um, and also our executive, our current executive director, Beth Stein, and our former executive director, Andy Para, also had involvement. But there was fundraising, um, there was a design made, uh, kind of permaculture based. Aaron had taken a permaculture course, so there was some influence in that. And uh, originally that was just, there, there was, I don't remember if we saw the Park Coast house on the video, but there is a house there. So. Right, there was a house there. And then there was just a flat lawn, kind of not well kept, weedy, scruffy. And that's what Nearby Nature originally walked into and worked with. Um, <laughs> flat, scruffy yeah, lawn. Yeah, <laughs> flat, scruffy, so see what can be done. And they did a lot of sheet mulching. They got, I know that some compost was brought in from the U of O, will donate compost to nonprofits. Mm. Um, the U of O has an amazing system where they really do a great job in using all their food waste, both from like their preparation and from the kids just eating in the cafeteria and recycling. They do a phenomenal job of, I didn't know that. of compost and creating compost. And, and then sharing then, it. And then sharing it, yeah. So, um, so the landscape intentionally became less flat, you know, adding elevation. Some of it, some of the piles too were kind of created from all the prunings, all the trimmings. There was different shrubby, undesirable things that were cut out mm -hmm. and piled and then covered with, with soil, uh -huh. with dirt. But um, just as far as kind of environmental awareness for kids, having, having differences in height. It just adds interest. It, it keeps their attention. Um, and then the city, when they cut down trees in the park, you know, if we want them, we can request, request some trees. So we've gotten logs, and then we have to find volunteers to come and cut them up for, me, for us so we can get stumps set up. Um, mm -hmm. So some of that 
that is a constantly ongoing process because you set up your stumps in a couple years, they're going to start breaking down. So um, last year I recruited a young man that I knew in the neighborhood to come out with his chainsaw. We had a couple of logs that were delivered and, and we added more stumps and replaced some ones that were deteriorating. But it was um, really an amazing process from what I can tell looking at old pictures. There was, like I said, it was just lawn. And, and also in front of our site, the city of Eugene, in partnership with Nearby Nature, um, has installed a water wise garden, which is also beautiful. And that's all um, maintained and planted with native plants that don't need a lot of water. And they have a collection tank that goes off the Park Host roof and goes into a, a rain-driven, a rain-powered fountain right on that site. So mm -hmm. it's something to, if you haven't been there, I know you've been there, Lee, but if any of the viewers haven't been there, it's Day Island Road just past the community gardens. The Waterwise Gardens are lovely, and they have a big placard, a big kind of, I don't know, signboard there explaining explaining um, how to do water gardens, the different kinds of techniques you can do. They have a resource that's there that lists all the plantings. So it's, it's a great resource for people that are interested in doing a more sustainable landscape. Mm -hmm. Well, in addition to seeing the Waterwise Garden, are mm -hmm. you open to visitors checking out the Learnscape? Well, I mean, we are part of the park, but, but we really try to keep it just partly because of security and liability and well, we, of course yeah. you know we got we people's do. children you're responsible for right exactly so you know we are open to our campers and then we do have certain days where we'll open um, we'll have family nature quests that are often in our learnscape we had one recently which was an in um, I think it was insect safari or bugs by the billion but it was it <laughs> we changed the name a little bit each year to keep it fresh but it was a, an insect theme, Nature Quest. We have a wonderful volunteer who supports us, Rick Ahrens, who is a local um, naturalist who is our go-to guy for insect and bird identification. And he just, he's amazing with all the facts. He was there to kind of support the people with the, that wanted the more in-depth questions. And I was there um, with one of my interns to kind of keep it kid friendly and uh, we went out with our nets in the meadow and, and collected insects and observed and, and talked about the life cycle of an insect, things like that, and then released them. It's all catch and release. Mm -hmm. Talk about how it's their home and um, when some of the little ones were like, but I want to take it home. I'm like, how would you like if some big giant came and scooped you out of your house and <laughs> took you? And they were like, oh, okay, we'll let the grasshopper go. So um, it's <laughs> It's sweet. And then the Learnscape is open to them to play in for a while after that. So it's, um, yeah, we just, we feel like we, we can't quite, we don't have the manpower to have staff on site all the time there mm -hmm. when we're not running a program. So if we're not running a program, we don't really encourage people to come out. Yeah, well, that, that makes sense. Um, but I know that you do have specific partnerships with mm -hmm. people and organizations who, who you know, work uh, in complementary ways yeah. with what you're doing. Um, who are some of those? Some of those wonderful people. So I just mentioned Rick, mm -hmm. who's one of our wonderful volunteers. Um, Yvonne Young, who is a lovely storyteller. She's a retired elementary school teacher, and she's one of the coordinating members of the Eugene Storytellers Guild. She also has helped us as a nature guide in the fall, but she comes out and she does storytelling at the camp. Um, we had the Herpetological Society come out with some of their reptiles and amphibians. That's a local group. Uh, we also work with Northwest Canoe Rentals. Um, we have about half a dozen camps a year where we'll meet Ryan, the owner, um, down at the a good place to put in right across from Otson Stadium with some of our campers and we'll go canoeing. We go down the canal to Turtle Pond and he's just wonderful. He 
coordinates with us and he's if you feel like going for a canoe and a canoe trip and you don't have one of your own Ryan's a great guy to see he has canoe rentals there at Alton Baker every weekend all summer long I think it's Friday and Saturday and Sunday um, hope you don't mind I'm giving him a little plug here. No, not at all. It's, it's, he's wonderful. Let's see who else do we work with. Um, Kat has hosted our bike camps. We do some of um, the older kids will have bike camps where they meet at our site and they, they're on their bikes. They have to have a bike for the camp um, and they ride the bike trails and go different places and so the Center for Appropriate Transportation is one of the places they ride and they give them a tour of their site, talk to them a little bit about bike mechanics um, and that's right on the river trail. Uh, we work with the city of Eugene a little bit. We offer tree climbing and we offer rock climbing at the columns and the city rec part department comes out. They have all the ropes and equipment uh -huh. so, so we partner with them and we incorporated that in a couple of our camps this year. So I'm trying to think if I'm missing anybody. I, I'm sure I am. We have just a lot of wonderful partnerships and we try and we're always looking for more. We're, we love getting people from the community that are, have skills or knowledge to share. I had a young man who was had just graduated from college and had a little time the beginning of the summer coming. Uh, he, he just uh, sent in a volunteer interest form and I noticed he was a musician and I said would you like to come and sing silly songs, silly <laughs> nature songs for our kids and uh, so he came once a week until he had to go off on his next, mm -hmm. I think he was going traveling, you know, the, he was a recent college graduate but so we had him coming to camp for about four weeks and I'd love to find somebody else for next summer because mm -hmm. that was a lot of fun. We all sing and and dance and everything at camp anyway, but it's special to have somebody if they can come with their guitar or yeah. you know, do something a little more a little more in tune. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and you were telling me earlier that um, it's really important that that you be able to do educational outreach because while there are plenty of parents who recognize that it's important for their children mm -hmm. to understand their child's connection to nature, you know, mm -hmm. all of our connection to nature, right. that not everybody realizes that. And so I, I'm i sure you have some outreach efforts al already underway. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't you um, just mention some of those briefly? Yeah, and it, it is one of the things that is a struggle for our program because the people that are likely to seek out our scholarships or just to send their kids to camp because they have the resources themselves to do that are going to be um, aware mm -hmm. and already have that sense of the importance of the connection. So we do, um, it's, it's a conversation within our organization, what can we do? Oh, the school field trip program that we run in the fall and the spring is one that because uh, their school classrooms, classroom teachers will bring a school group out. And so some of the kids, they might be their first time at Alton Baker Park. It might be their first time seeing how fun it can be to go out in a nature walk and exploring. And when they come, we give them our flyer about our camps mm -hmm. and about our other programs, our nature quests, hoping to get the families more involved if they aren't already, mm -hmm. you know, get them engaged in the natural world. Um, and then we do things like Head Start had a fair in the Whitaker neighborhood. We went to that. Um, we try to have a presence in some of the local festivals. We'll have our tables out, try to let people know about what we're offering. But it is, it's a challenge. I mean, maybe we should be out at Valley River Center. <laughs> well, maybe that's something that, to to keep in mind. Yeah, if any volunteer would like, if anybody would like to volunteer to go out to Valley River with nearby nature flyers, <laughs> call us. Well, we've got one one more short video clip mm -hmm. uh, that I want everyone to see. So, uh, why don't we watch that and then we'll we'll uh, tie things up. Okay.
One of the things that we have as part of our educational programming is a water catchment system. So from the roof of our, we call this building the Nature Hut. It's a, basically our supply storage area. And um, we have the gutters are hooked up so that the water runs into this 300 gallon tank. And we can fill up, the kids can fill up watering cans from here and use them in the garden. Um, it's not enough to meet our irrigation needs, but it makes a dent and it's a great way of just showing the potential. Um, this, you know, by the first couple months of the rainy season, not even, you know, this tank is full. It, it fills up very quickly. We could, we could fill 10 times this many tanks if we had them. Well, that's actually encouraging to hear. If you had the space for more tanks, mm -hmm. then you would have enough water to do all of your, con your uh, irrigation. Right. And um, I've seen, you know, they're coming out with different tank designs. I've seen some that you can almost set up as walls where they're, um, you know, like big rectangular shapes. So I think we're going to see a lot more water catchment as time goes on. And it's, it's a great use of of the rainwater, um, which we certainly have an abundance of certain times a year here. So I particularly liked seeing your cistern because water conservation is a you know an interest and a concern of mine, and I'm really glad to see that that is part of the the total experience mm -hmm. for the kids who participate in your programs that they learn that it's normal to save rainwater, to uh, capture it in a cistern, and then to use that water to water the garden. Mm -hmm. So um, talk a little bit more about just your, your general uh, approach to good environmental practice and, and how the kids can be part of that. Yeah, um, so I believe I, as I believe I had said in the clip, our catchment system unfortunately isn't big enough for to support our garden. We still have to have to use other water sources. But um, the kids love being able to fill their little their their little watering cans up with the rainwater, and we talk about how it comes from the rain. And then, uh, you know, all of in all of our camps, we try to model good practice. Like we are sure to compost. Of course, this isn't just water. I'm, I'm, just talking resources in general, but we make sure they compost their lunch scraps mm -hmm. or any unused fruit. We encourage, you know, just conservation in terms of even, you know, we want them to wash their hands, but you don't need to run the water full force for five minutes the entire time. So just building that sense of thoughtfulness, mindfulness yeah. about your actions is a big, a big part of it. And then some of our camps have more of a focus. We had a couple camps that focused on water. Um, one was a preschool camp, Make a Splash, which I taught. So it was basic, but just, you know, we had a lot of conversations and um, stories about just the importance of water to all of us and where it is in the world and the distribution of water and, and all of that and the wonderful properties of water that we can use. And then there was an older camp called Wild in the Watershed that really looked at the watershed and managing your watersheds, thinking about the potential for pollution of the water too and, and our valuable resources, how we can keep our watersheds healthy and safe. So um, we, we do try to educate in our camps as we're having fun and running around and hiding and doing crafts <laughs> and other things. We work that in. <laughs> so so you're, you're, you're learning good environmental practice, uh, natural cycles uh, that, that affect all of us and that we can mm -hmm. all just sort of participate in without needing to think about it. It just becomes part of daily living. Second uh, nature, yeah. yeah. Good conversation, uh, conservation, excellent. So. Um, you've already mentioned that you need volunteers to, <laughs> to help you, so I'm going to put in a plug right now for you uh, that P 
people who are interested in providing any kind of monetary support or volunteer support mm -hmm. should look on nearbynature.org to exactly. find out how to get in touch with you and how they can help. Mm -hmm. Why don't you uh, talk very briefly about the opportunities that are available for volunteers sure. and what kinds of training and orientation that, that you can provide. Okay. So we have um, educational programming that we're looking for volunteers for and that would be in the summer it's for our day camps and for that there is a two-day training. It's four hours a day so um, but we provide you with some basic information about the ecosystem, the environmental um, aspects of the park, where things are, and some techniques and resources. And you have a training binder, too. You have a binder of resources, of games, songs, information about the park um, for our day camps. And also, our nature walk guides, we also have a, a binder that goes with them, just good resources. Also, natural history information about Alton Baker, so they're have a good resource to look look to if they have any questions. And our, our nature guides um, volunteer spring and fall. Uh, we do school field trips. So for that, you can volunteer just one day a week, you know, one morning a week. It's usually 9 to noon. And they are um, five training sessions for that. And we offer each training session twice, um, either. So we try to over about a two-week period, so we try to accommodate everybody's schedules mm -hmm. so that they'll be able to get to the trainings. And then we also have LearnScape, so the garden maintenance, and if you want to come and just help in the garden, and that would be on-site training, you know, on-the-job training, and the same would be true of our cleanup and restoration volunteers. And we offer internships in all those areas also. So if you're a college student, um, LCC, U of O, you want to do an internship, we can work with you that way. So I'm assuming if it's an internship, there's credit yes. that, uh, available for mm -hmm. students? Yeah, uh, through their institution, but um, you know, there's some forms that we fill out and we do a little evaluation at the end and verify hours. Mm -hmm. um, there's a certain number of hours per credit, 30 hours per credit. Wow. Do you, do. Get a, do you get a lot of interns? We are. We're really fortunate. I think the fact that we're right across the bridge from the U of O is huge because they can come and volunteer for us if, even if they don't have a car. It's easy to get to mm -hmm. us. A very handy place. And plus, we're a lot of fun. Yeah, we're, you certainly are. <laughs> we're more fun than any of those other internships out there. <laughs> I can vouch for that. <laughs> <laughs> so why go elsewhere? <laughs> <laughs> well, Joe, it's, it's really been a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, it was nice to watch the video and remember all over again what a magical place you have there at Nearby Nature. And I hope that everybody who's watching this show will tell all their friends and neighbors to send their kids there and go themselves, you know, mm -hmm. and, and just learn more about what you're doing and see how they can help you to do more of it. So, Thank you. Thanks for being on yeah. the show. It's Thank really, you. really been a pleasure. Oh, and haunted hike in October. <laughs> okay. Nearby nature's haunted hike in October. All right, duly that. noted. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. This has been Gardening and Beyond, a show for folks who turn who turn over rocks to see the critters underneath. Join us next week as we continue exploring that big green world out there. See you then. Let's, let's